So as we wrap up this chapter on chapter 6, we're going to do another quick brush by, I guess, for lack of a better term, of concepts that we learned last year. Schrodinger's equations allow for the concept that both wave-like and particle-like nature of matter could be incorporated. So we had learned that sometimes light acts like it's particle, sometimes it has wave-like behavior. Well, the same description can be made about matter, specifically electrons. So they came up with this new way of looking at physics of particles that are moving at near light speed over infinitesimally small distances and <clears throat> that have no mass and are basically not locatable, or almost no mass. And so that new branch of physics is called quantum mechanics. What's different than last year is that we can use one of these wave equations to be symbolized with the Greek letter psi. And if you square psi or psi squared, that's where you get that probability density map of where an electron has the probability of actually being located. So for example, I used this slide last year. This is the probability map for an s orbital, where like 90% of them are kind of hunkering in closer to the nucleus, roughly describing a probability density map with the shape of a sphere. So when you deal with these wave functions, um, they're also called orbitals, then you can find the energy of those orbitals as well as the shape. So each orbital is describing a spatial distribution of electron density. And the way we described it last year was an orbital is a location where there's a high probability of locating an electron, but that's as good as you can do is on a probability basis. It's described by a set of three quantum numbers so let's do a review, a review of what we've covered today. The principal quantum number is your energy level, and they always have to be integers that are greater than or equal to one. There is no zero. And as of now, since we have discovered through the seventh row of the periodic table, there are seven known energy levels. The angular momentum quantum number, or the L value that we talked about um, yesterday, I believe, those are the uh, numbers that describe the shape of the orbital. And so what's weird is we call them quantum numbers, but we're going to actually use letters to designate the shape, and let's take a look at what those are. If you saw for a value of L to be zero, we're talking spherical orbitals. One, P or dumbbell orbitals. Two, um, <clears throat> double dumbbells, I like to call them, and three, the F orbitals. Remember that was sharp, principal, diffuse, and I forgot the last one, old terminology that actually just describes the shape. The magnetic quantum number, m sub l, sub l, that describes the orientation of that orbital in space and, or around the origin, it had a range of negative l to positive l. So if, for example, let's take a look at that. You're talking about s orbitals. <clears throat> well, the, magnet, the quantum number for the s orbital shape was zero. Um, you could only have one kind of s orbital. But the quantum number for p-shaped orbitals was a one, so you could go from negative one to zero to positive one, which explains why there are three p orbitals, each of whom have uh, orientation around the axis on the x, the y, or the z axis. So that's where that one kind of S, three kinds of P's, five kind of double dumbbells, and seven F's came from last year. Here is the chart on which we worked um, in class showing the possible values of the energy level, the possible shapes that were allowable, that's the shape here in each energy level. The subshell designation just means sometimes we call energy levels shells, and then any subdivision of those we call a subshell. So, for example, at the third energy level, the amount of sublevels you can have are subshells. Subshells are 3s, 3p, and 3ds. And each of those can have one kind of orientation in space, or p's can be oriented three ways, or the d orbitals can be in, uh, or, uh, oriented up to five ways. So, that was our magnetic quantum number. Again, here is the spherical orbital, or s orbital. Every level has one. They just keep getting larger and larger the farther you get from the nucleus. This I'll slow down on. This shows you as if you had 
your 1s, your 2s, and your 3s orbitals all superimposed on each other. And see these kind of white spaces here? That's what we call a node. And the height of the graph is indicating the density of the electrons at a specific distance from the nucleus. So let's take a look maybe here at the second energy level. So you could have at this node, see how the probability of locating them is pretty much nothing? That means that between the first and the second energy level, there's like a dead zone where electrons can't be. Here now you can see between the first, the second, and the third, now there are two nodes where the probability of locating them is zero at that distance that's between the first and the second, and between the second and the third. Here's another graphical picture of that. So <clears throat> if we only had an s orbital, what we're saying that in um, the first energy level in angstroms, it looks like it's a little less than one angstrom, is the highest probability of discovering an electron cloud. Remember, an angstrom is one times, uh, well, there are one times 10 to the 10th angstroms in a meter. So it's, I guess, uh, one over that number equals the number of angstroms that are, uh, sorry, the number of meters in distance. I kind of botched that, so don't worry about it. Little tiny number, 10 to the minus 10th meters. So the nodes are those regions where there's zero probability of locating an electron. In the p orbitals, here's our node right here. Remember, electrons go, don't go into the nucleus, but we were kind of cavalier about how we sketched them in beginning chemistry. The lobes um, emit out from the origin, but electrons are not going into the nucleus. So that's where the node of the p orbital would be. The d orbitals have an l value of 2. Uh, four of them are the double dumbbell types. The fifth one is that dumbbell with a donut kind of very crazy one. If you only have a one electron atom like hydrogen, which is why Niels Bohr's experiment worked perfectly for hydrogen but nobody else, orbitals on the same energy level have the same energy. What do we mean by that? See, normally at the second energy level, if it was a multi-electron atom, the 2s would be closer to the nucleus than the 2p. And we think of the nucleus being down near the bottom of a sheet of paper, and the energy of each of the levels and sublevels gets higher and higher as you go on out from the nucleus. So there's a new term that I do need you to know. When you have the same energy level, or electrons that are having the same energy, we call that degenerate. I don't know. Don't ask me. I just, I just try to explain it. But really, this is what we learned last year. If you have more than one electron, then as the number of electrons increases, you get more of what we call electron-electron repulsion. Be sure to use this in any response that you're dealing with on questions about where electrons might be, and especially also about, uh, well, we'll come to that, uh, bonding, for example, and intermolecular forces. So as the number of electrons increases, so does the repulsion between them. And therefore, that means with many atom electrons within an energy level here, notice now that the 2s sublevel is of lower energy than the 2p. They are no longer degenerate. They do not have the same energy anymore. Closer to the nucleus is lower energy. It's been a long time, but if you think back to the lab we did last year where we analyzed the spectra of two gases, hydrogen and helium, and looked at it through our diffraction grating, we discovered, some of you did, that it's possible to have two really, really close to each other lines on the emission spectra. And in the 1920s, it was found that two electrons that are in the same orbital do not have exactly the same energy. That's because they have a fourth factor that we've overlooked so far besides energy level, shape, and orientation. The fourth factor is the spin of the electrons. Here's Amy coming by to say hi again. Let's just sit on my lap, Amy. So the spin, actually, of an electron is really describing its magnetic field because when charged particles spin on their own axis, they, have, they generate a magnetic field. And so that's what you might have seen if you had super good vision or if you had a really nice spectroscope. You might have been able to see two spectral lines very close to each other. 
Well, maybe what you were lucky enough to see is the fact that in the fourth quantum number, the spin quantum number, or sometimes called the magnetic spin quantum number, m sub s, the two electrons that are spinning, if they are in the same orbital, must have opposite spin. And I guess arbitrarily they've attached a value of plus one half and a minus one half to those numbers. And that's it. Those are the only two choices. If there is one electron spinning one way, then there's another one spinning opposite. It's more correct to say it that way than to say one spins clockwise and one spins counterclockwise. But as you can see, it has something to do with setting up a little magnetic field when you have a charged particle spinning with, of course, north and south poles. So what last year we learned as the Pauli exclusion principle, uh, only two electrons in a box, I think is what we said, what it really means is that no two electrons can have the identical set of quantum numbers. You can be at the same energy level. You could be in the same shape orbital. You could be in an orbital of the same shape that has the same orientation of space. But once you're trapped in that little box with your electron buddy, you must have opposite spin. So no two electrons have exactly the same um, uh, set of quantum numbers. Now kind of a variation of the quantum numbers, this is what we learned last year. We have electron configurations. The large number stood for your energy level. The letter stood for the shape of the orbital that the electron was orbiting in, or electrons. And the number in the upper right, the superscript, shows the number of electrons in that shape orbital at that particular distance from the nucleus. Besides electron configurations, you could have drawn orbital diagrams. Boxes stand for orbitals. The up and down arrows stand for electrons that have opposite spins. And it's okay to have half-filled orbitals, and as you can see, this is going to be critical as we go to study bonding shortly. Okay, so last year we learned the Huns rule as no empty bus seat. Don't sit next to the smelly homeless guy on the bus if you can help it. Everybody goes to their own seat on the bus, and then if more people get on the bus, they come back and double up. Here is the official description of Huns rule. For degenerate orbitals, that means these 2p orbitals, they're all on the same, contain the same amount of energy. The lowest energy is attained when the number of electrons with the same spin is maximized. We learned it as electrons go in one at a time into an orbital and then come back and double up. So we're going to just refine some of the rules that we learned last year. Last year was grasping and comprehension, and this year is more refinement and understanding the nuances of chemistry. And we also learned, according to the Aufbau rule, that we fill orbitals in order of increasing energy. And we learned that the periodic table could be divided into S, P, D, and F blocks that correspond to atoms having orbitals of those different types or shapes. Now there are some irregularities when you have enough electrons to half fill S and D orbitals on a given row, but I'm going to stop there and discuss these few anomalies on, uh, in class during lecture. And you will see on the AP exam occasionally some questions about those, and it's not too many. But what we're trying to point out to you is, when you look carefully at some of these, for example, you would think copper would have been argon in brackets, 4s2, and then you would say uh, 3d9. And instead, it's got one electron at the 4s and 10 at the 3d. We're going to talk about the why of that in class, and that will probably conclude the new topics that are different in this chapter than from beginning chemistry last year. See you at the next podcast.